much he liked it when he looked out at the room and saw dancing because I'm not a dancer. <laughs> like, if, if God were to come down and fully inhabit my entire body, this would be me dancing just going. <laughs> I was feeling it. You just would never know by looking at me. Well, once upon a time, a brand new hotel employee was asked to clean the elevators and report back to his supervisor once the task had been completed. The end of the day came and the employee never reported back. The supervisor simply assumed that like the rest of those he had hired for this particular job, that the employee had quit. Three days later, the supervisor ran into the new employee. He was still inside one of the elevators cleaning it. The supervisor asked, surely you haven't been cleaning these elevators for three days, have you? And he said, yes, sir, I have. This is a huge job. Have you ever done it? I'm not done yet. Don't you realize there are over 45 of these elevators, two on each floor, and sometimes they're not even there. Think about it. Did you get it? It's just not funny, is it? <laughs> Today we are looking at the topic of delegation. And not the kind of delegation where you delegate to someone else, but the kind of delegation that God delegates to us. I know for myself, delegating something or trusting someone else with the things that I feel that I'm good at or the things that I think that only I can do really well is very difficult for me. And I've had to learn that the hard way over the years. This is my 21st year of being a pastor. And for the first 16 years of my career, in that time span, I was actually hospitalized for exhaustion six times. I don't understand balance. I love my work, I love what I do, and if I'm not careful, I don't share my work with others, especially others who are capable and are wanting to help. And it all has to do with trust. Trusting that with time and with training, others can do the job as good as I can, or maybe even better than I can. The passage that we just heard Jason read is all about this. Again, it says, Jesus went through all the towns and all the villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. So imagine for a second if you are Jesus. And if you do that every day, you probably need to see a psychiatrist. But just for a second here, imagine that you are Jesus. You're living in your corner of the world, and you decide that you are going to go into every city and every village and every town, and you're going to deliver sermons there, and then you're going to care for the, the sick and the hurting and the helpless. What's more, though, even though you're Jesus, after you've done all of this, you can see that you still can't get to everybody. You feel compassion for these people. You feel moved to do something for them, and you want to help them. But there's just not enough time, and you're the only one who can do it because you're Jesus. And then Jesus turns to his disciples, and he says something profound. He says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. In other words, it's almost like he's saying, there are so many people out here that need help, and there's not enough people to help them. So ask God to put it into people's hearts to have a desire to help, because I am not enough. 
I can't do it on my own. Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, the Son of God, the Messiah, the one they've been waiting for, openly tells people that he has limits. That must have been something to hear. But Jesus, being fully self-aware, chooses to trust and to esteem his followers. They may appear helpless, but Jesus can see that what is in them is far more than they can see in themselves. There's another passage in the Gospel of John where this is further elaborated on, where Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than me. That's such good news because I always wanted to walk on water. <laughs> but what does that mean? Well, it means that if Jesus could do it, that his followers can do it. And in fact, if they keep doing it, they will end up doing even greater things than Jesus. That sounds insane to me. I can't absorb that with my intellect. It's like it goes in and just goes right back out. But this is what Jesus says his followers are capable of. If you're taking notes this morning, write this down. This is what I want us to remember today. God trusts you. God believes in you. You are capable. Yes, even you. A man named William grew up in the 1970s. And although he never wanted for much, his parents weren't what you would call particularly well off. William's dad worked as a factory foreman and he took every opportunity he could to pick up extra hours so that he could put money away in savings for his children's education. And at his work, he saw that the managers that were above him had all been to college, and as he got older, they just seemed to get younger and younger. And this angered him. And as his anger grew, he determined to make sure that his children would lead a better life than him, that they would rise above his status in life. So with the best of intentions, he pushed William and his younger sister as hard as he could, never wanting them to be satisfied with the life that he led. When they did well at sports, he urged them to go the extra step. When they got good grades in school, he berated them for not being the top students. He did his best to make sure that William was tough and taught him that to succeed in life, a person had to be able to tackle life's challenges and to bounce back, never taking time to wallow in self-pity or emotions. As time passed, William finally went off to college, and although his dad was very proud of him, he never told William this. He was afraid that if he did, that William would become satisfied with where he was, rather than continuing along the path to greater success. Graduating top in his year in college, William's life seemed to be on track. But then he met Susan. Oh, Susan. <laughs> and he fell deeply in love with her. And suddenly, William was happy just to be where he was. The desire to please his father that had driven him for so many years just kind of faded into the background. William and Susan eventually got married and they had children of their own, but financial success eluded them. Before they knew it, their own children were in high school and within the first few weeks, William's oldest son, Joshua, was suspended from school for bad behavior. And William was furious. And that night at home, he let Joshua know about it. Joshua's failure pressed a button in him that 
unleashed his repressed anger, and he heard himself telling Joshua that he let him down and that he wasn't good enough. And as the words were pouring out of him, he had all of these memories begin to rush back into his mind of his father saying exactly the same thing to him, and instantly he realized, oh my gosh, I've spent all of my life trying to please my dad to gain his recognition and his acceptance. And everything in that moment was put into perspective for him. The message that had been carved into his consciousness over the years was, nothing you do is good enough. Why can't you do better? And there in that moment, standing in front of his son, William Brooke, and became silent. And he looked at his son deep in his eyes and could see that his son was actually devastated by what he'd done at school. And he was deeply disappointed with himself. So William reached forward and wrapped his arms around Joshua and said, Joshua, my beautiful son, I love you and I believe in you with all my heart. No matter what you do, I will always love you unconditionally. Please forgive me for getting angry. That's my stuff. I was wrong. Now, let's you and I talk about what it is that you really want and how we can work on creating that future together. Every week, here at CIB, we pray the, the prayer we just prayed today called the Lord's Prayer. And it begins with two very important words. The most important words a human being can ever utter to God. The words, Our Father. God is a perfect Father. And we are his kids. We are not employees who are laboring to gain approval from our supervisors. We are not farmhands working on God's farm. We are not disposable. We are not easily replaceable. We are children of God. All that God is, all that God does or can do, God trusts you with it. To take that goodness and to display it in the world in a way that is uniquely your own, and yet filled with a kind of transcendence that is bigger than you. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. God trusts you. God believes in you. You are capable. Yes, even you. This week as you go out into your life, and you are presented with the 10,000 things that life brings. Challenges that push play on that audio player inside of you that just plays on a loop and saying things like, you can't do that. You're not qualified enough for that. Don't you even dare. You are so broken and so damaged. What makes you think that you have anything to offer to anyone? And when those things play inside of you, remember that that is not God speaking to you. Turn the volume down on those things, and as an act of defiance, do them anyway. Do the good things anyway, even if you're scared, even if you don't think you're good enough. Leonard Cohen said there's a crack in everything, 
That's how the light gets in. God isn't wanting you to be perfect before you can handle things that are perfect. With God, all things are possible. And not only are they possible, they're probable if we will simply take to heart God's view of us instead of our view of us. We're kids. We stumble. We need training wheels. We get upset over little materialistic things. We rub slime into the carpet that you have to call the carpet company to come and I'm, that's my stuff, sorry. <laughs> but what we are in need of is looking at ourselves through the eyes of God. And when we do that, Something about that changes our perspective, not only on our, for ourselves, but in how we look at everyone around us. You'll never believe that other people are beloved children of God if you don't believe it for yourself. It'll just be an act. It'll just be a charade. It'll just be fakery, mental ascension. To believe deeply in your heart that you walk these streets and ride the metro and commute not as a broken, damaged human being for whom there is no hope, but as a child of God that is participating in the messy work of grace. I want to ask the band to come back up, and I think it might be nice if we would, um, well, you guys can decide how much of it we play, but I'd love for us to at least sing the chorus of that song, Anything Can Happen, again. And as the band is singing this and playing and looking at the words, I want to encourage you to not just think of this as a form of Christian karaoke. <laughs> but it's true. Anything really can happen in your life. Anything. God can 